All right. Hi, everyone. My name's Nat, head of community at Exceptional Individuals, and every Thursday we deliver these inspirational, exceptional, enlightening, some may say, webinars on neurodiversity and related subject areas. Today is going to be really insightful, and it's going to show depression in a way that you may never have seen before. Depression is one of those things that everyone experiences it sometime, but that thing like, am I depressed or am I, how, do I have depression? And what is the relationship between feeling down and being neurodivergent or feeling down for a long time, which is affecting your day-to-day -day life? When we talk about being neurodiverse and it being disabling, is it the condition that is disabling? Or is it the baggage that comes along with the condition, such as depression? These are just some of the things we're going to be tackling today. We are going to be looking at depression overall, but unfortunately for you lucky ND people out there, we are more likely to suffer from depression than the average Tom, Dick or Harry. And as such, it seems only right that we cover it today in a little bit more detail. As an organisation, the majority of us are neurodivergent, and I'd pretty much say 100% of us have had depression or at least be, have been depressed at some point in our life. Experts via experience, but also this research, a lot of it was inspired by my work in my master's at the moment. But I very much encourage any of you to share your own experience, your own point of view, and we'll go from there. The last webinar we did was on pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. It was a difficult one. Well done for those of you who attended it and get through to it. We've been learning about drugs and about what are they, how do they help us, how do they relate to neurodivergence, because we always get told you can't treat autism with drugs, but you can treat or support the treatment of co-occurring conditions such as mental health, such as depression. Depression! Yeah, today's a depressing subject, but it doesn't have to be because there is much research going on. And first of all, being depressed is a perfectly natural thing and depression is maybe when the body takes it a little bit too far. We're going to be looking a lot at today about the evolutionary benefits to depression and how they have helped us survive for millions of years and I think this is a nice way of looking at it because just how we have reframed neurodiversity to see the benefits that thinking different can bring to us there are also benefits that come as a result of mental health issues, such as depression. I'm not saying it's all sunshine and rainbows, far from it, but there are a lot of benefits that can come as a result, or at least theoretical benefits. Those are some of the things we're going to be looking into. First question I want to pop out to all of you is what ND, neurodivergent, condition contributes to depression? Are we looking at autism, bipolar? What other ones are we looking for? Schizophrenia? It is all of them. Yeah, all of them do. The main reason they contribute to depression is not because they are inherently baked into the diagnosis, but because if you spend your life with schizophrenia, it's going to be tough. Having autism, going to be tough. Bipolar, going to be tough. And of course, that can wear you down over a number of years. And depression... While you aren't guaranteed to get depression, you are more likely, worth to keep an eye on, and to kind of keep a monitor. Question to all of you, what is depression for you? Because we all have different understandings of depression, different ways we have personally connected with it. Share your experiences. Is it something to you, do you see it as a debilitating thing? Do you see it as just part of life? Suicidal thoughts. While it definitely Having suicidal thoughts is definitely part of the criteria in the DSM for depression. It isn't something that you have to have. If you have it, you're very much likely depressed, but you can be depressed without it. We've got being sad, no energy, not wanting to go out or interact with others, low tolerance, lack of interest in anything, unable to function in society because of negative thoughts taking over, oversleeping, a crushing sadness. That means I can't do the things I usually would. That's a powerful way of saying it. Not well liked, struggling with social connections, overreacting. Wow, many. Really interesting. One thing that, again, I really want to make clear is being depressed and having depression are different. That is crucial. 
But in terms of these things, being sad, well, that isn't depression. If you are sad for a prolonged period of time, for no apparent reason, that's depression. Let's say you're, I don't know, a family member recently passed away and you were sad for a month. That wouldn't mean you have depression because your reaction is perfectly reasonable to what has happened in your life. If you are just feeling that all the time and there's not a direct correlation or longer than you would imagine to be, then possible. No energy. We all have low energy from time to time. Maybe we go for a run. Maybe we've been doing a lot of revision. But if you always have that fatigue, again, for no apparent reason, it's possible. Overreacting, oversleeping, yes, oversleeping, undersleeping could go both ways. Another one no one mentioned is sometimes overeating, undereating. Feeling lonely, even when you've got family and friends all around you. Essentially, it's feeling all of these emotions, sometimes not all at once, sometimes all together, without necessarily the rationale to justify it or explain it. It's completely normal to feel emotions. It's just when do they start to interfere with day-to-day -day life. Here are some quick true and false. What one's true, which one's false. We've got depression often occurs with ADHD, attention deficit hyperactive disorder. Neu ND, neurodivergent individuals, are often more prone to depression than neurotypicals, NTs. And mental health professionals need training to work with ND clients. Let's see what we got. Boom, boom, boom. All correct, again. Unfortunately, people with ADHD are extra prone to depression. A lot of it comes down to how ADHD affects the body. We've done previous webinars on that. I can't go into that whole subject, but there's unfortunately a strong link. Next, neurodivergent individuals are often more prone to depression than NTs. We've already covered that. It is true. And mental health professionals need training to work with ND clients. I can see some of you said maybe that's not true. It is because just having training on being, saying, a mental health first aider, while it is great, it doesn't mean that you have the right skill set without additional training to cater for ND clients with mental health. Because the way that the characteristics and the symptoms and how it presents itself can look and feel completely different. You do need to have additional training. April, a new April, has says it's recommended to find a therapist who specialises ND then. Maybe, ideally, yes, but specialised, I would say at least have basic awareness and tr training, yes, because it just looks different. It's like having someone who has only supported autistic males and then you're a female. They're not going to have the same background knowledge in order to help you as good as someone who has had that prior experience. Anora says, ND you're dealing with? Yep, absolutely. A specialist, ideal, but the reason I was reluctant to say yes is they're far and few between. I don't want you to say I'm not seeing anyone because I can't find a specialist, but at least you could say, are people aware? Have they had that additional training? Sophie says, I'd say yes to specialisms. Just training can be just a workshop or a day they attended, not enough. I completely agree with you, Sophie. I was just a bit reluctant to be hard and fast, just because I know in my local area, these specialists do not exist. If you can get them, absolutely. Next one. What may be a sign of depression in a neurodiverse individual? Might you see some social withdrawal? Increased sensory sensitivity? That's when sounds are too much, too itchy, too hot, too cold, any sorts of those senses. Or difficulty with executive functioning tasks, kind of reasoning and how your brain will piece the puzzles together. And, as always, they are all correct. When we talk about, say, conditions like dyspraxia, it's really interesting because we often know it's to do with how the brain processes information. And a lot of the time, bosses and managers are confused because sometimes their dyspraxia seems to be a massive barrier and other times looks like it doesn't even exist at all. And I always say to people, while these conditions are lifelong, they fluctuate depending on what you're going into your life. Your mental well-being and how your characteristics of your ND are completely interlinked. If you're really stressed, depressed, going through some traumatic thing in life, the things which you normally contribute to, say, dyspraxia, are going to be way more apparent 
The same could be said with autism, where you might have stronger sensitivities than you would normally do, and social withdrawal. But yeah, it, these are all things to really look out for. Again, being neurodivergent, I personally don't think is a disability, but I do think that having it means you are more likely to be disabled by other factors and elements in life. The struggle is very, very real, but I do think that it's important to know that two things are separate, but also how they kind of interlink together. But please, if you disagree, let me know. Which of these have you experienced this week? And the timing is really important when it comes to, is it depression or is it just feeling depressed? Have you had a depressed mood? Have you had a loss of interest, a change in appetite, sleep disturbance, agitation or loss of energy? We've got quite a lot of people being a bit agitated, poor sleep. I know I'm feeling knackered today as well. In terms of how we diagnose people, there's different guidebooks, but one of the main ones when it comes to worldwide is the Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders, the fifth edition. And these things, again, if you have just experienced in a week, maybe that's just how you're feeling. But if it's for a long period of time, maybe depression. Q7, hate this questionnaire. Oh, yeah, and I hate it. When you do, got, I'm sure a lot of you have done those questionnaires where you've got to say if you're suicidal, you're depressed, and you're like, I only came in for a headache. And I'm thinking maybe I do have all these things. Those questionnaires always kind of concern me. And they'll be looking at it. And I was, according to this, you're feeling a lot worse than you were a week ago. And I was like, I don't remember what I put. Like my, <laughs> my answers are always changing. But yeah, those things are challenging. They do have to do it though. When I say they do have to do it, who are these people? Who are the people who determine whether or not you have depression symptoms? And why do they decide? This reference I mainly used here is the APA, a a P yeah, which is the American Psychological Association, but it's similar people no matter where you are in the world. What we've got here, we've got one for academic, one for doctor. This question is more difficult or more nuanced than you would probably think to begin with. Who determines? Well, do doctors determine? Doctors will be the person that says, yep. From this what research that I have been given and I have learned, you have it. Partially doctors, but academics, they're the one who do the research, creates the guidelines, maybe them. And then with you, because if you didn't think you had depression, you may not even go to the doctors. It kind of is a combination of everyone. First of all, the academics have to create the research and they have to back it up. Then the doctors have to learn it. And then you have to actually go to the doctors. In terms of who determines depression symptoms, some of it comes down to how you portray or exhibit your symptoms. Some people mask really well and as such might not meet the criteria for depression because it's not how what the doctors are looking for. The doctors have an idea of what they believe depression is, but say if new guidelines from academics come out, completely be a game changer. But academics are also beholden to the doctors because if they create all this research and the doctors don't implement it, it's effectively worthless. There's lots of different people who are involved, but do not undermine yourself. You are definitely a part to play in this. We've got mental health professionals, researchers, and organizations such as the APA determine diagnostic criteria for depression based on research, clinical observations, and expert agreements. Sometimes it's just observations, other times it's like brain scans. There's multiple ways of doing it. Anna says some are depressed from very early. So they won't know how often they think it's part of their personality. Same as ADHD. That's really true, actually, because they often ask you, how have you felt over the period of the last six months? Because they want to see like the long term. But if you have always felt that way, how are you going to know? And another thing is while I keep mentioning that being ND and mental health are separate, that's intertwined, how do which one begins and one ends? You might be saying, this might just be my autism, or it might be mental health. One of them I can treat, one of them I can support. Next question is, what do you believe is the biggest barrier to mental health services for neurodivergent individuals with depression? What is stopping us? What's this big old roadblock? 
Do we have a lack of resources and accommodations for people who think differently? Do you think there is stigma around neurodivergent conditions which might make it harder to get support for mental well-being? And do you think that the difficulty with social communication is stopping us from getting support which doesn't stop maybe more neurotypical individuals? Let's see which the winner is. Difficulties with social communication. Wow, essentially, we might be struggling, but we're not always able to communicate it to the wider world. And this is really difficult because when you go into the doctor's surgery, you've got 10 minutes, you're on the clock, you've got to tell them everything that's going on with you in a succinct way as possible. But some of us, we go off on a bit of a tangent and that 10 minutes has run up quite quickly and they tell you to go. Some of us might be like hypochondriacs where we like, we think everything's falling apart. There's so many different kind of dimensions. But also, for instance, if you go to a GP and say, and they find out you've got depression, you've got autism, well, we're going to get you support for depression. They're not going to get you that specialized service. Or if they are, you are going to be on a waiting list, like as far as the eye can see. Like that waiting list is going to take years. I know that because I needed ther talking therapy because I like my OCD and autism. And they said, well, we can get you normal OCD training, which didn't help me. We can get you like autism, but you want that specialist one. You've got to wait. Four and a half years later, still on the waiting list. Luckily, I know it's horrific. And when I gave me talking therapy, they gave me 24 sessions, 20 minutes once a week. Do you think 20 minutes is honestly enough for like five sessions to help someone? Not at all. But it's, we're dealing with what we've got here. And also there's a lot of stigma. Sometimes people looked at me and thought, because you're autism, you might be exaggerating some of the things that you are mentioning. So they I felt they didn't take me as seriously because of previous diagnosis. Anna says GPs are happy to give antidepressants out without much investigation. You want therapy, it's much harder. Completely agree with you. And there's many reasons for that. Giving pills, nice and simple. We're not running out of them because organisations make money from it. Whereas talking therapies, other kind of more holistic approaches, they're more resource, resource intensive. They're less profitable. They cost more funding. It's tough. It really is tough. This big old book, these are some of the criteria. There are other books, but these are some of the ones that people normally look for when they come to diagnosing you. They'll be looking at, do you have a depressed mood? How long have you been depressed for? Do you have a diminished interest in life? Things like, say you were going to a water park, which everyone loves. And you're like, are the things that normally bring you joy no longer bring you joy. Have you had a significant weight loss or gain? It's more about the extremes. It's not whether you lose or gain. It's just, is this some extreme? Are you really struggling with sleeping? Are you more agitated? Is it taking longer to think and kind of get your ideas together? A loss of energy, feeling worthless. Delusions is another one. Sometimes people think that maybe I'm suffering from like a schizophrenic episode when actually it's depression. Because though delusions can be attached to things like schizophrenia, it can also purely be depression as well. It doesn't have to have that extra layer. A reduced ability to think and suicidal thoughts. I must say, if you are having those thoughts, get help ASAP. Talk to someone because a lot of those thoughts do come as part of that delusional side. You think like everyone's against you, but they're not. Anna also says, my advice is take any therapy they offer. I went for something else. This is where I found ADHD was suggested. Otherwise, I wouldn't know I have it. No, I totally agree with you as well there. The help may not always be perfect. But another thing, if you don't take the help available to you, they are less likely to give you further help in the future. And I swear that's true. For instance, if you say, I'm not taking that medication, they'll be like, eh, well, can't help you. Or when they offered me CBT therapy, I did not want to do it. But I also know that if I go to them next week saying I'm still really struggling and I turn down previous help they gave me, they're not going to care, are they? You do have to take as much support as you're able to. What are some possible issues with this DSM-5? This big old book that tells you if you have depression or not. What's the issues with it? And let's have a look. So we've got the problem is the person rather than the environment. That's like a general kind of thing that people often say. The book is a little bit more blamey on the person rather than knowing about the environment we live in. 
We've also got cultural bias. This book was very much written from a Westin kind of white person perspective. And we also got, it infers that depression is a singular thing rather than something that is intertwined. Let's see, we got 50-50 almost for the first one. I would say the DSM, unfortunately, does kind of blame the person. It very much is what is happening to you. It doesn't take into consideration, like, what's your environment? What's your economic background? What is, like, the political situation in your country? It, it only takes you, not everything else. In terms of cultural bias, it really doesn't take into consideration different cultures. That, I think, falls onto the GP or the medical practitioner in order to input that additional lens on, but it isn't in the book. And it also does think, see every condition as kind of cut and dry. This is where it starts, this is where it ends. But we know that it's a big old blurry mess in the head, and it doesn't, it's not as clear cut as depression, schizophrenia, ADHD, it, it can be a bit of all. Next question is, why is depression damn prevalent in neurodivergent adults? Again, we mentioned a few of the things already today, but are there any others? When we talk about being neurodivergent, should we automatically kind of rope in depression alongside it? I have probably yet to meet someone who is neurodiverse who hasn't had depression at one point or another. Curious to know your thoughts though, is this something we can change? Or is this something which goes hand in hand that it's always going to be this way? Okay, we've got dismissal of comorbidity. Absolutely. When we're looking at things from multiple perspectives, people don't care. They're like, we are one thing and one thing only. Stigma, being difficult, doing different, not fitting in. We've got a lot of societal factors here. How other people treat us learned hopelessness also being disappointed time and time again misunderstood symptoms interestingly no one here says kind of like genes or genetics it's all about how other people respond and that while might sound not great it does mean that as society it's something that we can work on don't expect overnight change but it is something that with the right understanding is possible well, April says repetitive cognition in autistic people. Yeah, the way that the brain is always kind of going over might essentially wear it out and kind of get people feeling down. Getting the brain kind of fixated on things and not being able to move on. Always being super aware of how people are interpreting your behaviours. On this one, what I want you to do is rank the reasons depression is prevalent. You talked about what you think it is. These answers are part of the reasons. But what do you think is the biggest reason? that adults are not feeling great? Is it a result of our modern lifestyles? Essentially, if we went back in time, would we still be, would we still have depression? As a mechanism for dealing with sickness, when we're feeling really under the weather, the brain kind of like has a, a fuse and it short wires and depression is essentially your body saying, this needs to be reset. You need to change something. It's like a fail safe. And we also got as a mechanism to avoid conflict. If things get too heated, again, your body will just kind of shut down and kind of wait for everything to blow over. This is a, a reference which not everyone might get, but in my mind, if ever if you watched Wally, the like Pixar film, when Eva, the little female robot, was kind of waiting, the world was all like doom and gloom and she was waiting for like some hope, she just completely shut down. And this beautiful scene where Wally's trying to like get a little umbrella over her little robot hair, trying to keep it dry, but essentially she completely shut down until there was a plan and some hope in life. And depression is like that. The brain just kind of like, I'm done. I'm going into hibernation. I'm waiting for winter to end before I kind of come out of this rut. Maybe I should have just used hibernation as a better metaphor, actually. Well, number one, we've got as a result of our modern lifestyles. It's no lie that people are reporting more depression than ever before. Of course, we've got to factor in higher likelihood of being diagnosed because there's more awareness, but also... Our life is go, 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 go. It's very, very different from our kind of caveman and ancestors. Depression has always existed, at least from the records. It's been there really early on. But I would say our day-to-day -day life, technology, social media, everything is loud and busy. As a mechanism to avoid conflict, 
again, and none of these, by the way, are absolutely proven. These are theories that have been put forward, but I would say it probably is a combination. Unfortunately, this isn't the most flattering picture I could find of Andrew, but it's the one I found. Sorry, Andrew. But he did some research and he said, we outline the rationale of why certain features of depression, including in its environmental and genetic risk factors, its association with the acute phase response and its age of onset and female preponderance appears to have evolved from human interaction. A bit of a mouthful, but he was looking at multiple different factors with his team on how depression has evolved. Because most of us would agree depression sucks, but why do we even have it? Is it directly a consequence of the world we live in today or has it always been there and if what is the benefit of it existing <laughs> april says it looks like he had a good night yeah it did genuinely it was the best photo i could find i wasn't purposely screwing him over but yeah great research here is an evolutionary approach to why depression might not be that depressing understanding that we use it as a coping mechanism for illness when our bodies, when our physical health is kind of like, for instance, say we burn ourselves, our arm's going to hurt. If we kind of broke a leg, we'll get pain signals going up. Our body is telling us it needs help. But when it comes to mental health, we have a different approach. Depression, they say, is the body's response to say something's not right. Warning, warning, mayday, mayday, SOS, I need help. But we don't ignore it. Possible evolutionary reasons for why there's depression. I want you to say if you disagree or agree. Again, these are proposed, they're not definite, but they're interesting nevertheless. We have depression and immune system changes don't relate helpfully. Depression offers non-immune benefits. Depression protects against infections in those with weaker immunity. Depression doesn't help ancestors defend against pathogens. Depression has protective benefits. Depression isn't helpfully linked to changes in the immune system. If you don't know what these mean, just guess and I'll tell you in a minute. We've got disagree and agree. And again, these are things which have been proposed, but we're still looking to see if there's real evidence behind it. First of all, depression and immune system changes don't relate helpfully. When you're, we're looking at, like, if you get depressed, does our immune system start to shut down or does our immune system start to shut down and then we get depression? It essentially, remember, depression is that warning system. Then we've got depression offers non-immune benefits. This one is interesting. If we get depression, could we get benefits to our immune system or does it offer no benefits? And this is something which we're still kind of agreeing. At the moment, most of you have said no benefits but maybe having depression might trigger things in the brain to say, actually, immune system, go, 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 you need to go there. Just like when you get a cut, your blood cells start to clot up and they start to create like a scab in order to protect you. Could depression be doing the same thing for immune system? Depression protects against infections in those with weaker immunity. Another protection thing. Depression didn't help ancestors defend against pathogens. It did or it didn't. And, like, and they, these are questions we might not have answers to, but they're really interesting to see, is there a link between something which has evolved? Like, anxiety is amazing. Anxiety has kept us alive for years and years. But when our body gives too much anxiety, or anxiety in a context when there is no danger, that's when it's a bad thing. Is depression similar to anxiety? In the right context, it can be advantageous, but in the wrong context, or in a modern context, doom. Really interesting. We've got depression isn't helpfully linked to changes in the immune system. Again, we back and forth. I would love to give you answers to these. We're still learning. Anna says body and mental energy saving as a non-immune benefit. Yeah, sometimes it could be saving. Let's look at some epidemiology. Um, ep epidemiology. Sorry. Read it for yourself. But essentially it means upon people studying, studying people. And this is a lot we can learn from depression. Let's find out about the population. How prominent is de de depression? How, do, how many people does it affect on average? One in how many? One in five? One in ten? One in twenty? What are we looking at? 
Stats vary, but most people would agree that around about 5%, one in every five adults have depression. This is a huge amount. And this isn't just neurodivergent people, this is looking more general as well. And if we're looking at the theories behind, well, it's just our body's kind of response to distress. Let's say we're, there's pollution all around us, which there is. Maybe there's global warming, which there is. Maybe kind of work is stressful. We're worrying about debt and mortgage. All of these things we didn't have to worry about back in the day day. These might be all our things that our body are like, bad, bad, bad. But we're just doing it anyway because we're kind of locked into that type of lifestyle maybe unintentionally our kind of capitalist system we created a place where depression is unavoidable we're essentially shooting ourselves in the foot again just a theory but one which might have some merit in it which we should look into a little bit further what age do you think depression usually kicks in and this can also help us understand whether this is something which is biologically baked into us or if it is something which affects us from just being alive in the world we live in. Interestingly, we've got a few young people there. Let's see what we got. The average age is around 25. That's an interesting age because a lot of the time, things like depression will often kick in around like puberty. And that's because when the body's going through changes, it's kind of kicking things off. 25, well, most people are in kind of like working professions by then. There's a lot of stress, they might have kids, there's a lot of family elements. But it's also when the body has stopped growing and sadly is starting to die. Depressing. There's why. Well, yes, that is the age when the brain matures. I think men and women, they have like slightly different ages. But normally that's when the brain is like, I'm done. And then it's downhill. But we don't, yeah, we don't know. Anna says brain finishes formating at around 25, 27. If you have depression before. It might impact how you stay later. Yeah, very true. And I think you are right about the 25 to 27. I think, is it women mature faster and then men might keep going to the 27? I think it's that way. Yeah, brilliant. Which of the following is a potential treatment option for depression in neurodiverse individuals? Which one do you think is going to have the biggest impact? Are we looking at some CBT, some cognitive behavioral therapy, when you talk it out? Are we looking at some medication, a cheeky bit of surgery to kind of uh, take the edge off? Or are we looking at alternative therapies such as art or musical therapy? I think you're right. Like we're saying potential therapy treatments. We, the, we know the others work, but are there more holistic ones? Sophie, I'm not going to say that, but you know what? it doesn't work for everyone. Next one is, are we, are too many people on antidepressants? We, we talked about the are other therapies. We love about doing some art, you know, doing some community work, getting some fresh air. But as we said, the community, we are getting given pills all the time. Are we having too many? Yes, let's do CBT. Try to change ways of thinking of people who think differently anyway. Anna, yeah, that's a really good way of putting it, actually. Actually, that's quite, that is interesting. I might look into that more. Yes, we are prescribing too many antidepressants. That is true. But there's more to it than meets the eye. I think we spoke about it in a previous webinar where we talked about how while people are being over-prescribed antidepressants, that's undeniable, the amount of people who would benefit from them, who aren't receiving them, is way, way higher. About a third of people being treated for depression have depression. Only one third. The rest do not. Yet three quarters with depression were not getting help. Only one, f one out of four people received help. Really interesting stats. Before we start saying, too many pills. There's a lot of people who genuinely would benefit who aren't receiving them. There's multiple sides to this story. April says they feel scared to take antidepressants, not sure why. And there is a very natural fear of medication. Because you're putting something in your body that you may not understand. What I would say to you, and I'm not saying good or bad, but do your research, learn a bit more about it. Because when you realise that the body is all chemicals and it's naturally kind of going higher and lower and mixing, that all we're doing is just doing the exact same things. Every time you eat like an apple or some chocolate, you are altering the chemicals in your brain. Medication is just a untasty way of doing the same. But I do appreciate, talk to your GP about it. 
Sophie says, do you offer any sessions on deciphering which meds, if any, are right for you, i.g. when you're on them to know if they're good fit? Unfortunately not. That's way beyond my pay grade. I would get in, I'd probably go to jail if I was telling you that. But talk to your GP. Which is the biggest factor for depression? This one I'm interested to know. Do you think it's genetic? If you get depression, the biggest reason is because your families have that depressing gene? Or is it environmental? For instance, if you lived in a beautiful Hawaiian beach, no depression. You live in central London, a lot of depression. Which one is it? Interesting, we got majority of you think environmental. It is definitely a two factor, like it definitely is both. But as to as to which one has the biggest, let's see. One of my actual lecturers, Dr. Derek Tracy, he said this. He said typically the estimate in depression is that a third of it is inheritable, meaning genetics, and about two thirds is environmental. That's really interesting. We've actually got someone who has given a concrete answer. First degree relatives with depression increases the risk threefold. Let's say you're like your mum or someone like that or your dad has depression. You are three times more likely to have it. That's a big factor. But also living in an stressful environment are far more likely. You could have the genetic background to have depression. But if you look after your well-being, you may not have depression. Really interesting slide, I think. We're almost at the end. Hold tight. Let's look at a couple of environmental factors. If this is the biggest reason why we're getting depressed, let's have a look into it and see if there's anything we can do about it. Which of the following is the biggest risk factor for depression in neurodivergent individuals? Are we looking at, is it bullying or social rejection that's getting us down? Is it the lack of access to appropriate educational resources that is keeping us down? Or is it limited job opportunities and discrimination in the workplace that stops us from getting out of depression? We've got limited job opportunities, absolutely. I think jobs can give us tremendous amounts of purpose and without it, it kind of leaves us a bit aimless. Human beings like doing things. As much as we love saying, I wish I could watch Netflix all day, truthfully, I watched every single episode of Riverdale and my God, I'm done with life. But there are many. <laughs> we do need to have a purpose. Naturally bullying, unfortunately, all of these are factors. There are all things, though, that humanity has the potential to overcome. And that's why, in many ways, it can be more frustrating that we haven't yet. What goes on in our life is normally the single biggest reason as to why we feel the way we are. I just want to know, what are some of the burdens that you carry with you? Think about, like, each day, what in your backpack of worries, what are the things that are always there? Because depression is like a chisel and a hammer. Imagine like each day it takes a little bit of like a chisel out you bit by bit, like a big old rock. And eventually there's nothing left. So what is chiseling away at you every single day? Maybe it's your mortgage. Maybe it's debt. Maybe it's relationships, health, fear, any of those things. We've got myself. Oh, deep. Uh, unemployment. Yep, that is going to be continuously there, always worrying about what people are thinking of me. Am I make, How am I going to support myself? Where is my future going? Am I moving ahead? Uh, having a different body? But what are people looking at me? Am I unhealthy? Am I too thin? Home environments? It's too small. It's, it's chaotic. Um, all of these things being a burden to my family. Like, these things, while they may not be true, or you might overthink them, if you are carrying them with you, regardless of the fact behind it, it's always chiseling away. And these things, if you can kind of release or get through them, you, you lighten the load and it can help you. This is why spending some time de-stressing, getting off of a computer, getting some sunshine can make a massive difference. April from EI has says, wondering when I'm going to move close to my family in Newport Wells. I currently live in North London. I mean, that genuinely could have an impact on how you feel. It might take one of those kind of items in your massive backpack off of you. So I unfortunately don't have answers to all of these, but if you are able to reduce some of this pressure, it will reduce your likelihood of depression. Money, yeah. To end on, promoting neurodiversity and mental health awareness. 
What can we do? We need to educate oneself and others on neurodiverse conditions. The more we learn about it, the more we're able to understand ourselves and others to understand us. And it can help spot the warning signs a lot easier. We've got advocating for accessible accommodations and resources. Not just resources for mental health, but resources for neurodivergent individuals who are struggling with mental health. And also challenging stigmas and misconceptions surrounding neurodiversity and mental health. We are filled with stigmas. A lot of us who are neurodiverse are spreading those misconceptions without even realising. Knowledge is power. The more we learn, like, feel free to go to your doctor and say, what is your awareness on neurodiversity? And just make sure that they are the right professional for you in order to give you the support. It's a to ask these questions. I always have to, like, mention this because if any of you currently are having at depression at work that is a protected characteristic because it does count as a disability and you are entitled to get support in the workplace if you want to get for instance like some coaching or mentoring or equipment that you think could help with depression or and you want to have an assessment which is by someone who knows depression and knows neurodivergence get in contact with ei because that's kind of what we do when we're not doing these things any questions from the lovely audience today? Anything that anyone wants to share, say or feel? Sophie says, that feels like so much pressure to educate others. Yeah, I don't want to put the burden on you to change the world. Just think like, do your bit, like just bring it up to conversation when you can. You, you, can, you might always be able to change minds, but you can change hearts. It would feel so much better to say, here's a link, come back to me after to discuss. Yeah, I mean, that might work for some people. If you could find the link, you could try it. Each ND person is their own advocate, yep. I think because most of us are lovely, aren't we? I think as long as people, <laughs> yeah, as long as people know you're neurodiverse, they'll contribute that loveliness with that different way of thinking. If you are able to disclose publicly, I do think there can be benefit to the wider society, but also I'm not going to put that um, potential burden on you. Do it if it's right for you. Yeah, all right. Well, the next webinar is the future of ADHD medication. We're following this trend of medication and understanding the chemicals in our body. Yes, yeah, so I think this will be interesting for you because while we've done webinars before on ADHD medication, we learned what it is, what it does to the body. It isn't perfect. And at the moment, it's a little bit of a gamble. So have that. Let's see if it works. If it doesn't, let's try on something new. We may be able to come up with a better process. We're going to be looking at new technologies, new developments, kind of cutting edge stuff. Just go on Eventbrite. Anna says, Russell Barkley has weekly updates on ADHD research. Oh, thanks, Anna. I'm definitely going to research that for the webinar as well. And do subscribe to our YouTube channel if you're able to. Um, it brings me great joy to see more subscribers and you can catch up on this webinar and all the other ones we had delivered. If you want to find a community which understands you a bit better, check our Facebook group out. This one is our Autism Opportunities, but we also have one for dyspraxia, dyslexia, a general one. Here is the contact information if you have any further questions, follow-ups, or just want to get in touch. I told you it was a lot of content today, but we got through of it and in time, which is great. I hope you all found this useful, entertaining, and kind of just kind of gets the brain thinking a little bit. If you're new, it was great to have you. Would love to have you back again. And if you've come every week, thank you so much. It, it means a lot. Thanks, everyone. And yeah, see you next Thursday. Enjoy the rest of your day.